Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you along with Jason Quitt. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest, author of Astral Genesis, Astrological Keys to the Gods and Egyptian Postures of Power, Mysticism, Movements, and Meditations. Jason has been teaching and lecturing on the subjects of mysticism, out-of-body experiences, astral projection, meditation in Qigong since 2010. He has been studying various, various energy modalities and spiritual practices since 2002. After graduating from the Institute of Energy Wellness back in 2005, Jason has continued this incredible journey into the ancient systems of mysticism, metaphysics, wellness, and shamanism, and continues to this day. Jason, welcome back to the program. How have you been? I've been good. It's good to be back. It's good to hear your voice. And it was good seeing you at Beyond Belief when we did that taping. It was a lot of fun. You did a great job for us. How did you get involved in mysticism? That is um, a tough question because it came out of uh, left field. Um, I was dealing with um, out of I was dealing with uh, sleep paralysis back in my early twenties, and. I didn't know what was going on with me. Um, I was having um, these episodes where I would go to sleep at night and I would wake up, but my body was still asleep. And it was very terrifying. I didn't know what was happening to me. And I started to open up to this other world, this other paranormal world. And through sleep paralysis and trying to get out of sleep paralysis, um, I started to um, notice that there was um, a consciousness inside my body that was separate from my physical body consciousness. So in these states, my body would be paralyzed. I would feel something in the room. I was not alone. And um, I started to panic. And as I'm panicking, I'm trying to wake my body up. And it's almost like my physical body became an Egyptian sarcophagus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would be um, basically rolling around or trying to shift or move inside my body, trying to wake myself up. And one night I had, um, one night I just had it and I was violently shaking inside my body to wake myself up. And I shook so hard that I actually popped out of my body, just like in what people describe in near-death experiences. I found myself outside of my body, looking down at myself in bed. And it was like a real slap in the face of reality. Uh, at that moment, I knew that this wasn't a dream, that I was out of my body in some other space. And... I noticed at the foot of my bed, there was a very tall being or a, a shadow like being standing at the edge of my bed. And uh, this scared me so much that I immediately thought that I died. Oh, that, geez. You know, <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm out of my body. I see the Grim Reaper standing at the, the foot of my bed. And I was so scared that I got sucked right back into my body and woke up in a panic. And it was at that moment that I realized that it, there is consciousness outside of our physical reality, and we exist outside of the physical in a spiritual sense. And ever since that episode, ever since I left my body for the first time, something inside of me awakened, and it was this astral body or other consciousness that 
is myself, it is me, and um, there is a state between waking and dreaming. And if you start to fall asleep and you catch this moment between going to sleep and waking up, the, the inner body, the astral body, has an opportunity to awaken. So I learned about this just naturally um, going through these episodes of sleep paralysis. And I became so fascinated about this experience and so fascinated about this other world that uh, even though it was extremely frightening at first, um, I, I wanted to go out again. I wanted to feel that again and experience that again. And I knew how to do it through um, going to sleep in a meditative state, keeping my mind awake as the body falls asleep. And in that very short amount of time in between, that inner body awakens. and You can start to shift and move and push yourself out. And this is where I got my start. This is where um, I started to leave uh, my body and my entire world changed. And this is where I started to really get into mysticism and, you know, what is going on. Uh, We are not taught about this. Um, This is a, a human experience. And many, many people, I'm sure many people that are even listening right now have experienced exactly what I'm talking about. Did you have any help from anybody or did you have to teach yourself all by yourself? Um, I had to teach myself all by myself, but I believe that um, like the shadow at the foot of my bed, um, I believe that that was an initiator. It wasn't there to harm me. It wasn't, it was only there to show me how to get into that state. And trust me, it was very fear. I was very fearful, always terrified of this thing. But over the years, it, it's never harmed me or, or done anything other than show me that there is something more to this than just physical life. I'm talking with Jason Quit. His website is thecrystalsun.com, linked up at coasttocoastam.com. He's also on Twitter, or we would call it X these days, Jason, wouldn't we? Oh, yes. And uh, we'll take calls with Jason next hour here. Jason, you wrote a number of books, which we'll get into, but one of them was called Egyptian Postures of Power, Salute to the Sun. Tell me about that. What are Egyptian postures? Well, Egyptian postures uh, comes from um, my discoveries of leaving my body. So um, there was a time where I was very into uh, Qigong, still into Qigong, and Uh, Basically, what it is is that by standing in meditative postures, we connect to um, the universal life force energy, or chi, and we can cultivate that and move that energy through our bodies using various postures, just like yoga. And I started to have these out-of-body experiences where I was taken back to these temples in Egypt And there would be a person standing in a room, just like the statues, and they would be standing in a posture, left foot forward, their arms were out in a position. And instinctively, I knew I had to um, stand in front of them and copy the position they were standing in. And when I did this, I felt um, something open up above my head, and it felt like a waterfall a very warm solar energy moving through every cell of my body. And these were very profound experiences. So when I would come back to uh, the physical and wake up in this world, I'd still be in bed in those postures, and I would still feel the energy moving through me. And when I would break the posture, the energy would stop. Um, But then when I saw the Egyptian statues, um, because everybody has an Egyptian book in their house, Um, I flipped through the book, and I I saw that these uh, statues were all standing in these postures that I was being shown in these out-of-body experiences. And it just clicked that these statues are a teaching. They're showing you um, a specific 
knowledge, a spiritual knowledge, and they're showing you a way that energy moves or cultivates through the body by standing in various postures. So I went on this long road of, of research and discovery and trying to find what these postures meant, what would happen when you stand and meditate in these postures. And I found that the connection to this type of energy work um, is found all over the world. It's very popular in China. We call it Qigong. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I started to religiously practice this, and I would practice Qigong and the Egyptian postures three, four times a day. And um, I started to really feel and open up to the energy world. You know, when I was um, leaving my body at night and having these, you know, crazy experiences. And would you do this uh, often? Yes, uh, I would do. I would ha leave my body. Um, there was a time uh, around 2002 to about 2007, I believe, there was a good five years where um, it was hard to stay in my body. I would I would leave my body um, at least once or twice a week, and then oh, after that, lot. it's intense. <laughs> yes, it's it's intense, and I tell people, you know, the first five hundred times is very scary, <laughs> <laughs> but after that, it kind of just becomes a normal experience of just a part of uh, the dreaming process that you can tap into. Um, and this is where I really started to um, get involved in the spiritual community because I was um, basically alone. Like this is back at the time before YouTube, you know, so everybody today is, you know, when this stuff happens, they'll go and search Google or they'll go on YouTube or, or TikTok and watch videos. When this was happening to me, I had to go to the library <laughs> Exactly. Try to find try to find books on the subject. How did the ancients, Jason, understand this much more than many people do today? I believe that the ancient people um, were very much connected to the earth and to the stars and to themselves. Um, it was a completely different world where you know there wasn't uh, TV to distract them or or the media to completely distract. Um, they would have to live in the system of nature or they wouldn't survive. And when you're living in the cycles of nature, you have to know uh, the cycles of the earth, you have to know the cycles of the stars, you have to know the elements, what's good for you, what's not good for you. And I believe that they had a, a more general sense of feeling, uh, more like a psychic intuition of feeling energy. And because of this, they were more in tune of how energy affects them, how different times of day energetically affects them, what types of food and elements affect their energies. So over long periods of time, they would map this understanding of what is um, energetically good and how to um, cultivate energy, how to work with energy, um, and Back then, it was also um, part of healing. So if there was, um, and we still have this today in shamanism and uh, native cultures around the world, is that um, when there are issues in the energetic body, um, instead of looking for a physical way to work with that, they would use energetic modalities to work with the energy to relieve those uh, symptoms. And, you know, we have that today in uh, acupuncture, mm -hmm. uh, hands-on healing, energy healing, remote healing, um, using, you know, if you go to sh uh, shamanistic uh, communities, um, they use the spirit world. You know, they work with the plants, they work with the elements, they work with the um, spirit world, and they ask and um, guide the energy to... Um, to do something for that person. So it's still very much alive, but in our modern world, especially in Western culture, it's just superstition and it's just um, passed off as 
you know, they're still living in the dark ages and they don't understand. But by doing this, we're really cutting off a massive part of the human experience that our ancestors, all of our ancestors, it doesn't matter where you come from, knew about what we're talking about, knew about the spiritual spiritual world, knew about the energy world, and knew how energy affects us. And it, it's very, very simple. Like, um, if the earth has energy, gets it from the sun, um, the moon moves the waters. Uh, it, it's a dynamic flow of energy constantly. And, you know, if we don't move, we'll become sick. You know, so we have to constantly move just, just to have action in our physical bodies to stay healthy. We need to eat the right food, the right energy to maintain our health. And the moment we stop doing that, we start to weaken ourselves. So it's a, a mirror effect. It's if uh, we don't take care of the physical body, we're going to have physical issues. If we don't take care of the spiritual body, we're going to have spiritual issues. And this is where we start to get into the whole shamanic idea of entities and spirit and, and things that can actually damage or influence our energetic systems that can actually trickle down and have an effect on the physical body. And you believe in demons, that they're out there too? Um, yes, I do. And I've, I've experienced entities that you would call demons. Um, over the years, I've changed my perspective uh, drastically on the subject. And um, the way that um, I see entities today is that they are uh, manifestations of wounds, of trauma, of emotions, of thought forms. And um, they are basically, um, they, they can be considered a teacher because um, if they attach to you or if they're um, influencing you, uh, basically they are showing you a part of your energetic system that is uh, wounded. They're showing you a piece of your energy that is uh, weakened. And by knowing those areas, you can actually start to work on it and heal that energy in your own body. And you're also working on that entity to disconnect it. And um, so basically you become stronger and you get rid of all these things. And this is um, one of the first lessons that was being taught to me when I started leaving my body um, because I was having uh, contact, but I wouldn't call it alien contact. It was a spiritual contact out of the body. And what I was told is that my energetic field is very weak. They, they basically said that my energy field was like Swiss cheese. Was weak? And you, you would we, you, if you were weak, we're all weak. Oh, no, this is, this is at the beginning. This is the start of the journey. Ah, okay. And uh, basically, they said that if I was going to continue leaving my body, I would actually get into a lot of trouble because I would attract different entities to me, which did happen. So once you leave the body, once you leave the body, it's like you're, you're a light and, you know, the moths come at you. You're, you're, all, you're open for anything when that happens. That's right. So it is very scary. Like I said, it's a terrifying. <laughs> Jason, tell us about that incredible title. Sure. Um, I was actually uh, working on the, the next book, which was uh, the, uh, a continuation of the Egyptian postures. And I was writing um, a chapter called The Brazen Serpent. And the whole concept of that chapter was showing that uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead and a lot of ancient mystical texts uh, was hiding this uh, journey through the stars. And it was basically uh, the path of the soul of the deceased would travel through the stars to go to heaven or to ascend. And um, basically, as I'm writing this and going through um, the pyramid texts of Unas, um, I started to see that the gods were actually um, were dimensional in nature 
as in they were also considered the stars and constellations. So I started to go down this path of trying to decipher uh, these ancient texts and to see where it would take me. And, you know, if, for example, if you look at the Egyptian Book of the Dead, you know, the very famous scene of the weighing of the heart of the deceased. So the deceased dies, they're taken to the throne of Osiris, and their heart is being weighed on the scales of judgment by Anubis. And there's a very famous illustration of this uh, from the Book of the Dead of the Singer of Amon. And it shows Isis holding a grain of wheat. And this is an ancient symbol of Virgo, the constellation Virgo. You can say the scales is Libra, the wing, the balance is Anubis is Canis Major Sirius. Uh, there's also um, a bull's leg on a table in front of Osiris as an offering. And the bull's leg is actually Boots, and its star is Octurus. And Orion is, uh, sorry, Osiris is Orion. So I started to see that there was this, this story that the path of the soul or the deceased travels through the stars in a very specific way. And when I start to look into this, it mirrors the path of the physical sun and our perspective of how we observe the sun in our sky throughout the year. So it's the, it follows the, the metaphysical or mystical concept of as above, so below. So below, yeah. And I started to, to, to see this, and I started to see this everywhere. I started to see this story, even in the Bible. Uh, and this is what's called uh, astrotheology, that underneath these texts, there's another dimension to it, which is about the journey of the stars and the path of the stars and the path of the sun and the seasons. And then I started to look into um, the Valley of the Kings, because there's a lot of tombs there that have beautiful illustrations of the Book of the Dead. And there was one tomb, uh, Tourset's tomb, and there is this hieroglyph in this tomb, um, which is a a very strange hieroglyph. It shows um, a being that has two heads. And this being that has two heads, one head is Horus, and the other head is set, and it's coming out mm. of the same body. And this being is standing on top of a double-headed sphinx, and their arms are spread out across. It's a very strange hieroglyph. And I'm looking at this, and I see a pattern um, that goes to the stars, because this is what I'm working on. And when you draw a line from the center of this image to the outstretched arms of this being it is exactly 23.5 degrees on either side going through each hand. And what's important about this 23.5 degrees is this is the tilt of the Earth through its seasons from solstice to equinox. How would they know this? Exactly. How would they know this? And it's, it's perfectly encoded into these hieroglyphs. And as I'm looking at this symbol, um, I I remember that there's a secret to the pyramids. And the secret to the pyramids is that on the equinox, there's an optical illusion. If you're standing by the Sphinx, in front of the Sphinx, when the sun sets on the equinox, it sets right behind the middle pyramid of Caffrey. And the optical illusion is the sun stands on the back of the Sphinx. Now, they say the left shoulder, but it stands on the back of the Sphinx. And I'm looking at this hieroglyph, and it's Horus and Set, which are solar deities, and it's standing on the back of the Sphinx with its arms spread apart at 23.5 degrees. So it's measuring the solstices and equinoxes. And this is why there's two heads in one body, because Horus, light, Set, dark. His hands are equally apart, 12 hours of night, 12 hours of day standing on top of the Sphinx on the equinox. So it's, it's an exact image of what's actually being played out on the Giza Plateau. So the Giza Plateau and the pyramids is a very ancient timekeeping mechanism of the sun. So the sun will actually uh, set behind the first pyramid, Menkari, at the winter solstice. And then throughout 
the season coming towards the equinox, it moves north to Caffrey, and then it goes in between Caffrey and Khufu at the summer solstice. So if you stand looking at the, if you stand in front of the Sphinx, you can look at the setting sun and know what time of year it is. So this is like an amazing correlation. And this is found all over the world. So I, I, I thought, and when you do a, um, when you do a map, um, a satellite map looking down at the pyramids, and you draw the line from the Sphinx to the pyramids, it also follows the 23.5 degree rule that we see in the image of the hieroglyph. And so this just blew my mind. And I started to think, uh, could this code be found elsewhere in Egypt? And I started to look at other hieroglyphs at other temples. And I started to see this over and over again of these double headed beings with their arms or positions or their arms in different positions, just like the postures, they're facing a certain way, they're either standing, sitting, kneeling, or even laying on the ground. And each thing was, each, um, each hieroglyph was like a time stamp. It was showing you where the sun was during a time of the year. So these symbols had a dimension of this astrotheology built into it, Showing you where the sun was, and it was, given. and it was accurate too, wasn't it, Jason? Absolutely accurate. It, it, it was so accurate that it was exactly to the degree, twenty-three point five degree, and there was another degree as well. It was fifteen degrees. So they would use these numbers over and over again in their designing of their tools, of their artifacts, of the hieroglyphs. And what what's fi- what what is fifteen degrees? Fifteen degrees is the distance the sun moves per hour in the sky. So it was showing you calculations of where the sun is. And I said, okay, this is, this is too much for me. Like, I'm seeing this everywhere. And I said, let me see if I could find it in uh, Samaria. Let's go back to Samaria and look at um, the, the tablets. Let's look at the tablets of Shemesh. Let's look. Let's look at all these things, because they also have solar gods. Which is modern-day Iraq, right? Correct. Correct. And I started to look there, and it was there as well. Exactly the same thing. Um, It was was put in a different way, but the 23.5 degrees was present in those images. I say, okay, so, you know... Babylon, Samaria, Egypt, you know, we already know there's some type of connection there pretty close by. And then I started to broaden my search and, and through history. And I even went as far back to Gobekli Tepe. So we're going back almost to the last ice age, and I'm finding the exact same thing in artifacts from Gobekli Tepe. So I say, okay, how is this possible? Okay, but this is, you know, all the same area, kind of, you know, it's kind of close. What really made this discovery substantial was that I went to North America. I went to South America. I went to Central America. Looking for what? Looking for what? Looking for symbols that were solar symbols that had the same exact code that was found in the hieroglyphs of Egypt and Samaria. So I was trying to find, did people in America's ancient cultures in, in South America, Central America, and North America, did they know about this 23.5 degrees and 15 degree code that was placed in symbols? And I went, and to my utter shock, I found it all over. North America, Central America, South America. Which means that the Egyptians came here. It, it's, it, it, the only conclusion I can, I can say to this is that all these civilizations around the entire planet had some type of common heritage, yes. some type of common knowledge. They're all connected. It's all connected, and 
what's miraculous about this is this code is so complex that I had to write a whole book about it because it's not something you just look up in the sky and say, okay, this is obvious. You know, this is like a very specific code, and it has to do with the ratios. Now, let, let, me, let me describe what I mean by the solar ratios. Um, we have uh, latitude and longitude on the planet. So we have the equator at zero degrees latitude. As you go north or south, you get 10 degrees north, 20 degrees north, right? Now, as you go up or down, if you go up north 10 degrees, 20 degrees, the north star moves in the sky to those degrees. So if you're 20 degrees north latitude, if you look at the north star, it's 20 degrees in the sky. That's how it works. And what that means is that in each latitude, the sun is in a different altitude. The sun is in a different position depending on where you are on the planet. So this is a very, very precise um, geolocation um, understanding. So to navigate the planet, you need to know where the sun is and where the North Star is to know where you are on the planet. And what I found was that these artifacts also, also encoded latitudinal information in the artifact so that when you would measure um, the degrees or the angles that were used to design the artifact, they lined up with the exact latitudinal information of where the sun is in the sky during the solstices and the equinoxes. And they didn't have telescopes in those days either, Jace, did they? No, they didn't. Well, they had uh, observ uh, observatories. <laughs> like, they, they would have like uh, ziggurats where they would go up and they would look at the stars. But this is so precise. And the cycles of time that they would have to observe certain objects in the sky, some of them were like thousands of years, like Sirius. You know, to get a, um, the Sothis calendar, it's over, it's almost 1,500 years to get that star back in the same position to start the cycle again. Well, outside of investigators like you, how did this knowledge get lost? I don't think it got lost. I think it was just kind of hidden in certain groups um, because uh, the reason I say this is because I found it all over the world, but the most interesting place that I found it is in Leo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's work. Really? Yes. Um, he put it in um, his image of the Last Supper. As code? That, the code is in the Last Supper. And... It, it's an incredible painting, and it's, it's laid out in a very specific geometric shape, tuned to 26 degrees, 23.5 degrees, 15 degrees, 52 degrees. All these things have to do with the sun. And it's even shown, or people suspect, that even uh, the 12 apostles are the 12 zodiac, and Jesus in the center is uh, represents the sun moving through uh, the zodiac of the stars. And that's exactly what the geometry is actually telling you. If you just look at the geometry of how this painting is, is set up, it follows the exact code that I found in Egypt, that I found in Samaria, that I found all over the world. So in my mind, People do know about what I'm talking about. It's just, I don't know if um, it's in part of some type of secret society or it's not talked about, um, but I've even seen this in layouts of cities. So I, I know that, um, you know, um, Masonic temples or Masons build architecture uh, for cities, and um, I've seen these type of codes right into the architecture. Jason, you were talking a little bit about the pyramids. Exactly why do you think they were constructed? 
I think that um, they had multiple reasons, but I believe um, from everything that I've been shown is that they are solar symbolism. A pyramid is solar symbolism, especially the ones uh, on in Giza. And uh, they were constructed as a calendar to map the stars and the sun to show the cycles of time. It's a gigantic megalithic clock. Um, and that's just one dimension of what the pyramids are, um, in my uh, opinion. Awesome. How they were built, I, do, I, I couldn't tell you. That still boggles my mind. Oh, it is truly remarkable. I'm just not sure, you know, 100,000 Egyptians tugged those boulders and those huge blocks up and formed the pyramids. I, I don't think they did it that way. The only thing I could think of is they had some type of acoustic technology that could levitate or, or help reduce the mass so they could move them um, and lift them. Yeah, they had, they had a secret to be sure. Now, this code that you have discovered tells us what? It tells us that the most important thing that these mystics uh, looked into, or one of the most important things, was cycles of time. And that there was a reflection of the stars and the sun uh, that could be seen on planet Earth. But most importantly... It was a reflection of the human body, and I think this is the biggest, um, the biggest connection to all of this, is that um, the code is within the physical human body. And the way that ancient people used to measure the sun was they would use their physical bodies as the tool of measurement, because the body follows the fundamental sacred geometry of the universe. It grows with very specific proportions. So when you're looking at the sun in the sky, if you outstretch your arm in front of you and you hold your hand up to the horizon and the sun, the, from your eye, from your perspective, to your hand, to the sky and the sun, equals 15 degrees, one hour of time. So the body was first the measuring tool of the heavens. And the planets and the stars they saw as a reflection within the human body that had an influence and effect on the human body. And um, even, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, again, a Vitruvius man, his famous um, illustration of the human body in the circle and the square showing the, the sacred proportions. And those proportions um, match the ratios that we find in these solar codes. So I think when it really comes down to it, the most important understanding of what this code means is that we are a reflection of the universe. We are um, a reflection of the cycles of time. And all of this information is encoded within our physical bodies. And by using our physical bodies as the measuring stick, the measuring tool, we can measure the cosmos with our arms, our hands, our fingers, our legs, and our feet. And this is also where the, the measuring system of the Egyptians come from. When you think of the cubit system, the cubit system is the measurement from um, the bottom of your elbow to the top or the tip of your middle finger. And the average of that is about 20.5 inches. And then the royal cubit adds four finger lengths above that. Um, so the ancient Egyptian measuring system was based, again, on the arm and the hand. And it's the same thing as the eye looking at the hand to the sun. And if you remember, the, the, um, there's a very popular symbol that's found all over the planet. They call it the hamsa, where it's an it's a illustration of the, ha the hand the open palm hand with an eye in the center of the palm. Hmm. And if you think about that, and what I'm saying to you is that if you take your hand and you take your eye with your outstretched arm and look directly at your palm, the eye to the palm, to the sun, you get the measurement of time and space. They were brilliant, weren't they, Jason? Absolutely. They were so smart that when I'm going through this, 
even um, uh, like the native communities in America, like Chaco Canyon, the, these these um, sun daggers, these these petroglyphs that they designed, like it boggles my mind. I have no idea how they figured it out to be so precisely perfect that they could measure where the sun would be, where the shadow would be cast, and where the sun would shine in a very specific point. It's unbelievably precise. Um, so they were they were geniuses, and our modern mind, you know, when they, we look back, it's like we know they worship the sun, but it wasn't a worship of the sun. It's they. It was a science. They knew how to map the stars. They knew how to use it to navigate. And you know, for us. We look at our watch, or, or today we look at our iPhones to get the time. Back then, there wasn't anything like that. How did they know what day it was? How did they know what month it was? Exactly. How did they, they were so smart? They can build monuments that they can just look up at the monument, see where the sun is in perspective to the monument, and know exactly what day it is. We don't have that mindset today. We can't see that. Let's go to the phones for you. Let's start with first-time caller Ruth in Gurney, Illinois. Hi, Ruth. Welcome to the program. Hi, uh, Ms. Denori. I'm so glad to get through to you with such an important conversation I've tried hundreds of times, wondering why people can get through over and over. We have a gold pyramid in Gurney, Illinois, next to Great America. Yep. But your song prior about having known somebody and didn't know where or when, I knew George Armstrong Custer in another life. Uh -huh. He married the Indian chief in this life who came back as a woman. He also married the daughter of an Indian chief whose name in Indian means blame the woman. I believe it's possible that she did have a child, a boy. He did not have any children with Libby Custer. They were soulmates. They were both met in Monroe, Michigan, and he went on to become a West Point cadet and officer, and their braves are in New York at West Point. So the times that I had met him, but before I say it, I want to ask the guest, does he know why the Indians called him Son of the Morning Star? I think it is significantly important. The first time I saw him was in about 1957. I was about 9 or 10 years old at the Museum of Science and Industry. What an incredible gift you possess. Uh, what do you think of that, Jason? Well, um, the name is definitely significant. Um, the, the, the morning star is something that um, these astronomers, these shamans would look at and wait at very specific times. The morning star could be Venus or it could be Sirius. It could be, you know, there is many types of stars or planets that was called the morning star. It is the star or the light in the sky that comes up above the horizon right as the sun rises. And this was, um, it was almost like um, the light of the new world, basically. So it was a very important sign to see a, very, a specific planet or a specific star directly above the horizon to bring in the new sun of the day. It was a very sacred um, ceremony that many cultures around the world would look at. Are you still attempting astral projection, Jason? Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't happen as much as it did about 20 years ago, but um, usually it happens around new moons, full moons. Um, it just, now it just happens more naturally. Let's go to Joe in Monterey, California. Hello, Joseph. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my call, George. Sure, Joe. Um, I was wondering um, if your guest has ever stood um, next to an obelisk. Um, they have a certain uh, phenomenon, uh, or shall I say a natural occurrence of physics, 
where the energy will flow through the obelisk in, in, in one direction. If you stand on one side, one side to it, you can feel the energy going through you. And on the other side, you could feel it leaving you. So they knew about uh, sacred geometry and energy. The pyramids are like solar collectors. They collect energy. But, you know, George, you know about uh, antennas. The shape of the antenna will dictate the wave. You capture the wave. Well, these uh, pyramids were also mystery schools. They held mystery uh, schools and teachings inside the pyramid. And uh, that probably um, allowed them to travel out of the body. More importantly, allowed them to receive information from the heavens as well. And also, some of the pyramids had channels of water, like tunnels, underneath. And they say to all the, the, there was like tunnels of water in it. Well, when water flows underground uh, around something, it will enervate you. It will take your energy away. And when it do, stop, doesn't flow, you can get energy. So they use this around the pyramids, from what I was told. Uh, to It's like a safeguard that nobody would go near the pyramids because they would feel weak. Uh, and some people felt that the pyramids might have been uh, a kind of weather control. I think um, Tesla also experimented on, with pyramids and sacred geometry. And a further little tidbit, uh, when I was in, initiated into the Melchizedek, when I was ordained, we did our, our ordination in New York City, the Mason, uh, the, the Mason headquarters, you know, the, the, uh, the Mason Hall in New York City talk about symbolism the shriners thank you for taking my call george okay joseph okay you want to react to any of that chase yeah yeah i've heard i've heard all of those things um and and yes even um i've heard about going into the chambers to leave your body it was a way of traveling to the stars using the pyramid also the obelisk remember it's granite and granite is made of quartz so when you take this huge quartz granite obelisk and you put it up on the earth just the sheer weight of it in that spot is going to create a piezoelectric field, which will move electrons like an oscillation. So there is a, a phenomenon around the pyramids and obelisks, and this is why they're so important and they're putting them around the world. Uh, but the uh, piezoelectricity is amplified by the solar radiation. So it is like an antenna and receiver, just as the caller said. Next up, we've got Sandy in Connecticut. Welcome to the show. Hi, Sandy. Um, hello. I'm so happy that I'm able to speak to Jason. I could think I could speak, listen to him every night of the week. <laughs> um, I'd like to re- re- um, relay some things that he's been speaking about. Going okay. back, first of all, um, uh, 12 years ago, 17 years ago, and present time. About 12 years ago, there was, it goes back when I was divorced and um, had to do with my mother-in-law. And I wanted to tell my ex-husband things before I would die. I was 65 years old at the time. And um, I was dreaming. I, I, felt, I, I, I was asleep. And I woke up, but it was strange because I was speaking very uh, fluently going through all the things that she had done. And I was hearing it. It was like my body was in two parts. It reminds me of when Jason spoke in the beginning about sleep paralysis, which I had never heard about. But um, I had that experience, and I really haven't told anybody about it because it seems many things I'll share, but it seems impossible that you could be awake listening to yourself speak and the speaking was coming like from my mind I was listening but it wasn't that I was I was talking and listening to myself not knowing that I was talking well you had a classic case of sleep paralysis Sandy Uh, don't you think Jason absolutely and there is a part of us uh, you can call it a super conscious or subconscious part of us that in our dream state can communicate with us um, so sometimes in a lucid dream situation, um, I would stop, and instead of trying to control the dream like, like most people, I'll just tune into myself at that specific time and, and start asking questions for my, to myself 
and I'll hear a voice giving me the answers in the dream. And I think this is also how Edgar Casey also um, started to channel uh, through his sleep. And Tom's got text and tweets. Tom, what do you have for Jason? Anything out there? Anything coming in? No. Let's go to Emil in Toronto. Welcome to the show. Go ahead, Emil. Hi, how are you both? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I was uh, wondering, like, uh, I've been meditating for, like, a number of years now, and uh, since about 2020, I've noticed that I've been, like, uh, uncontrollably uh, rocking back and forth while meditating. Uh, is this, like, a part of a normal thing? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Oh, no, you're doing fine. Is that normal, Jason? Um, actually, uh, many people experience that. I had uh, a couple close friends um, that would meditate and they would um, shake. Or when they're going through a healing, uh, when, whenever they receive energy healing, uh, their body will shake. And um, for me, seeing that is, is normal. It's a way of how the, the body integrates and moves energy. Um, some people go a little deeper with that and say it has to do with the nervous system and the nervous system is kind of unraveling energy through the body and allowing energy to move through. Um, so I, I, me personally, it, it doesn't happen to me in that way, but I've seen many people go through that. Do you use these techniques, Jason, to do hate healing? Um, Yes, but it's not in that way. Um, I would use the techniques to build my energy system. And as you build the energy system, you have more access to, let's say, the connection of energy moving through you or the cultivation of energy that you've built. And then as you do energy healing or shamanic work, you connect to that source. And this is what we were talking about earlier where I said, you know, my energy was Swiss cheese. And I had to heal it because if I had holes or my energy was weak, my energy can be pulled and influenced very easily, and that is not good. But as I do Qigong, as I do the Egyptian postures and meditate, I'm healing the energetic structure around me so I'm more capable of being in that flow of energy. So for me, Qigong is basically the foundation of healing because it rebuilds the energy system to allow the energy to move through you. Jason, give out your website if you would, sir. Sure. My website is thecrystalsun.com. And you could also find my books on Amazon just by typing in Jason Quit. I saw the Jeff Bezos story yesterday and how he started Amazon. And it's amazing where the books just took off like crazy, huh? You know, it, it gives an opportunity uh, for self-publishers like myself to um, work on a book and then put it out uh, right directly to an audience on Amazon. And, so, and get it sold, too. And you do a great job, Jace. I'm going to be working on a new book, uh, the second part of the Egyptian Postures book. And I am also going to um, Stairway to the Stars in uh, Las Vegas coming up November 10th, 11th, and 12th to talk about astral genesis. Are you finding that people are getting more and more fascinated with these topics? Absolutely. And, you know, I've been, I've been talking about this for at least a decade now, if not more. And um, it, it just keeps going and going. And um, what I find fascinating is that the topics keep getting richer so um, what I'm learning today is like light years ahead yeah. of what uh, has been talked about 10 years ago. So it, it's, it's really an amazing community. That's great. Tom's ready with a text and tweet for you. Jace, what do you got, Tom? Jace, this is from Carrie in West Virginia, and she says, how does Gobekli Tepe and astrogenesis relate to an ice age, or do they? The way that it relates is that um, the artifacts and the sites are found when the Ice Age starts melting. So at the end of the Ice Age and the first civilizations, you start to get 
um, Gobekli Tepe, and uh, the Neolithic age. So um, how does it relate? It, it just shows you that as the ice receded, uh, cultures began to develop more, and this is where we start to find an explosion of civilization around the planet. Back to the calls east of the Rockies, Brian in Indianapolis. Hey, Brian, go ahead. Hey, George, I got the Daily Double today. I can't believe it. Yes, you did. I had to read. I had to redial 92 times to get through today. <laughs> that happens. Hey, hey, listen, real quick. Yes, real quick. They called George Armstrong Armstrong Custer the son of the Morning Star. The Native Americans called him that because he attacked the, Amer- the Native American villages in the, in the pre-dawn hours. Uh-huh. That's why they did that. That's why they called him that. So, hey, listen, oh. what a great topic, Jason. And I got to thinking, you were talking about all these out-of-the-body experiences that you have. So I got to thinking, do you have a, when you do this, do you have, I got three questions, and I'll take, you can, I'll take the answers off the air. When you do this, do you have like a spirit guide that goes with you or are you by yourself? That got me thinking, do you consider yourself a time traveler when you do this because you do it so often? And I don't know. I have talked with Tommy. Do you do you see stuff like George always asked? Do you see stuff that could be or will be? And George, I'll see you in Columbus. We're going to have some good conversation. Okay, Brian, look forward to that. Uh, let's start with the second question about time traveling. You wrote a book about the John Teeter, the time traveler, a couple of years ago, didn't you? I did, and uh, that unraveled very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I, I, that type of time travel, uh, the John, uh, Teeter time travel for me, um, is a hoax. Um, and I kind of figured that out the hard way. And I know a lot of people get angry at me for saying that, but the, the time travel that, um, I do talk about that I would consider to be very much real is the out of body time travel. Because when you leave your body, it's, you're leaving time and space. So you can jump different timelines. Uh, mostly you go back to past lives. So you get to relive or see things over again. And then you have the very rare times where um, you're propelled into the future. And it's very confusing um, and also very frightening. <laughs> um, so, yes, I would consider myself... Uh, an astral time traveler. All right. Um, do you in have that regard? Do you have spirit guides that assist you at all on anything? I believe that they're always there, and uh, it's very strange because sometimes when you're traveling, let's say like you're flying through the air or through space or wherever you're going, it's like they're uh, behind you and they have a hand on your shoulder. And they speak to you telepathically. Uh, so you could like ask questions in your mind and you receive the answers in your mind. But you could feel the presence of them behind you and you have the hand on your shoulder. Um, and then sometimes when you're just out of your body, there's different beings that will come to your bedside to talk to you. Uh, and I consider those to be guides or helpers or, or beings like that. And, of course, one of my favorite slogans are these things that will be or could be when you talk about futuristic events. What do you think about those? Um, I always say they're potentials um, or there are other timelines that have already played out. So it may be like an echo of some other timeline, uh, not necessarily here. So when I uh, see things, um, I don't really believe that what I'm seeing will happen here, uh, but I'm open to the possibility that it may happen here. So uh, in, in my mind, it's some it's happened somewhere else, and it's for us a teaching of what could be possible down the road. Let's go to Bob in New York. Hey, Robert, go ahead. Yes. Uh, hello. When I Google the picture of the Last Supper, it appears the one of the 12 disciples uh, that, or the apostles that are at the table, the one to the left appears to be a woman. 
is that a woman, uh, that person a woman? If so, which of the 12 apostles is missing? And also, in the symbolism, if I look at the the entire picture, I see the three windows in the back. Is that representing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And what other symbolism is there at that Last Supper? Thank you for the information. Are you familiar with the Last Supper at all, Jason? I am. I am. And I'll start with the windows. It's the three windows which is uh, the three windows of the solstice and equinox, and these are the um, uh, the windows of Babylon. Um, they're very ancient. They're in ancient structures all over the world. The three windows are designed so that the sun will enter um, the center window during the equinox, and the two windows on the sides are the solstice. The sun will enter through those windows. As for the apostles, Yes, um, I believe that apostle is supposed to be John the Baptist, but in this painting, um, it does clearly look like a woman. Um, so they say, um, "Could it have been be, Mary, Mary Magdalene?" Yes, and you could see there's another apostle next to them, and their hand is pointing or touching the Adam's apple. Ah, that's intriguing. So it's showing you there is no Adam's apple, so it could be Mary. Next up, let's go to John in New Jersey. John, let's get you in here. Go ahead. Hi. Um, we know that in the pyramids, they use this tar-like substance or asphalt for mortar in between the bricks of the pyramids. But you see all these pictures of these workers carrying these jars, you know, and pouring a liquid substance in front of the blocks. You know, I have a theory that they took ships and they took jars to Saudi Arabia and got crude oil and brought it back Mm. along with the tar for the mortar, and they poured it, and they slid the bricks. But I don't know how long it takes for the tar, the asphalt, and the crude oil to break down. What do you You think of that as a possibility, Jason? Uh all possibilities you, are open. I, I haven't heard that one specifically, but like I said, I don't have an answer to how they built those pyramids. Um, it's just an incredible wonder. Somehow I think sound resonance had something to do with it. That is the most interesting possibility of all of it. Let's go to Michael in Santa Fe, New Mexico now. Michael, take it away. Uh, hello, George and Jason. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating topic. I Indeed. had a very quick question I wanted to ask. My grandparents had a farm in upstate New York um, near Cornwall. It was Cornwall on the Hudson. And uh, my uncle was actually chief of police up there. And uh, there was uh, a night after night, I'd look out the window, and as I was dreaming, uh, I would imagine that I was flying out the window and uh, I would fly around and then I would go different places. And I kept returning to this uh, cemetery in uh, Windsor, Windsor, New York. And uh, it was kind of weirding me out. So I put a ball bearing in my pocket. It was about almost an inch and a half in diameter. The same thing happened that night. I flew out the window I go to the cemetery, there's this obelisk, this very tall, uh, it was someone's monument, but in the corner of the grass, I put the ball bearing, and then I flew back home and went to sleep. I was probably seven or eight years old. And the next morning I got up, I went to the graveyard, and I peeled up this piece of sod where I had put the ball bearing, and sure enough, there it was. I'd like to ask both of you, like Jason, what do you think of that? Um, just, I just got chills from my body. Um, <laughs> Me too. That's that's an amazing, amazing story. Um, like, I as well had a lot of similar experiences of you know going to the park behind my house as a child, like flying through the window. But for me, that was just dreams. Uh, what you're describing is an actual uh, event, much, much more. Yeah. And, and to, to say that it was buried, 
it, that that to me says that it, it, when you traveled, you went back in the past and placed that there. Time travel, Jason, is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Truly remarkable. Well, thank you for that call. And let's go next to Steve in Cicero, Illinois. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, I had something interesting to add to the uh, understanding that the uh, ancient people knew a lot more about science than we knew. Oh, yeah, you're right about that. Okay, I'll give you an example. In the mythology of uh, Hercules' trials, he goes to Atlas to find the golden apples. So, to cut the story quickly, uh, why would Atlas know what the golden apples were? Well, Atlas protects the Earth. And what does an apple have to do with the Earth? It's the shape of the magnetosphere, and it's powered by heavy metals within the Earth, like, like gold and iron. That meant that the, uh, back then they knew what the magnetosphere was. It's like a mnemonic. How, would they, they, how did they know these things, Jason? Did somebody tell them? It's very possible that they had some type of connection to advanced consciousness. Um, what about ETs? Like ET channeling, or they were just advanced. They, they were here for a very long time before us. And, uh, you know, the way I look at uh, these things, um, like Hercules, is, is allegorical. And it talks about the golden apples. Um, are this are basically could be looked at as the stars, um, the dra- the dragon or the serpent that is around the tree could be uh, Draco in the northern star region, um, and uh, the tree is the um, the Axis Mundi. So the golden apple could be the, the 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 pole star, and as we go through procession, the pole star changes, and that's why there's many golden apples because we have many different pole stars over the ages. How many books have you written now, Jason? I've got at least four here. <laughs> I Right now, publicly, that I'm selling, I, I have two out right now. And um, I think I've written about, I think you have all my books. I have uh, four that I've written, uh, but I'm updating and getting better at writing now. So hopefully there will be a third book for yeah. sale uh, within the year. Just keep doing what you're doing and keep in touch with us, will you please? Of course I will, George. All right, Jason quit his website linked up at coasttocoastam.com. His latest book is called Astral Genesis, Astrological Keys to the Gods. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.